Um, I, I will not cut too long in the coffee breaks, uh, um, but I had uh, one question uh, to Professor Reiner, uh, actually uh, two uh, remarks. First of all, thank you very much for uh, uh, your presentation, which I found very enlightening. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands, and that's uh, that part I would like uh, to, to uh, uh, deal with on two points. Um, as you correctly stated, uh, the Dutch current Dutch civil code uh, has a stratified, uh, so-called layered approach. Um, but then you said that the good faith provision only applies to real rights. Yeah. And uh, I think um, you have used the wrong translation uh, because uh, if you look on uh, the site of Dutch civil law, you see uh, indeed book three, uh, property rights. However, uh, in Dutch, it is uh, vermogensrecht in het algemeen, which means patrimonial right in general. So it means both the law of obligations, it covers both the law of obligations and uh, the law of property. So if you find something in book three, so like the good faith requirement, uh, it applies to all of the parts, also the other patrimonial fields, uh, uh, inheritance law. So um, it is not only uh, in, in good faith. And the second point, just briefly, um, is about the, the number of articles in our uh, transport uh, part, book eight. Uh, I always compare it to the Inuit, the Eskimos, who have uh, a great many names for different types of snow because it's essential for their survival to distinguish uh, uh, what kind of weather it is. Um, and we, the Dutch, we are very much dependent upon transport. 50%, over 50% of our national income is actually coming from transport, import, export. Uh, and I think that is how it can be explained as well that we have so many uh, articles, so many provisions uh, on uh, transport law. Uh, but first, uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think um, uh, and uh, the, the Dutch Civil Code, uh, for my thinking, is a very important example of the variety, because it shows that there is a civil code which is based on a very, let's say, detailed description of, it, it was not a criticism, but only to compare and, um, and it, as of course, is a, a richness. Um, uh, yes, uh, as, as, as far, let's say, my, my very uh, fable and weak critique is, um, I thought, you have a third book, uh, um, and uh, of course, there, there you find the definition, even if it's the whole of patrimonial rights, but, um, uh, it's not not structured in the way than other codes would be, who would have a, 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 or a first book, a general book, or first or uh, let's say norms, uh, general norms at the beginning of the code. On the contrary, also Austria do not have a general definition of good faith at the beginning of its code. So we are you are not alone, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, about definitions, well, uh, one can discuss about it, they, and, and as I told you, uh, they are useful if they are flexible. If they are not flexible, they are not useful. That's, but for me, the existence of uh, uh, the, um, the, the Dutch Civil Code is a very good example. I'm thankful that it exists because it shows that variety is very useful. I don't think that the, uh, well, but, but it's my personal opinion, and as, as not being a, a Dutch lawyer, but uh, let's say uh, I'm very uh, close to Myers for, for, for I read a lot of what he has written, uh, also in the Dutch language. But um, I think the, your actual code is not the code of Myers. It's not the code Myers would have, uh, let's say, uh, intended to to write down, let's say. But uh, the, there's uh, other aspects. And if I may just add a very, very small thing. Uh, I, I spoke um, about private law and uh, civil law 
about commercial law and so on, uh, we must never forget uh, a, a, an outstanding example uh, of uh, uh, a very particular approach to the question of private law, and it's the Swiss one. The Swiss one uh, about the uh, uh, law of obligation on the one hand side, which is civil and commercial, and then the civil law book. This should never be forgotten that we have uh, a third way, uh, and it's the, the Swiss one. And, and, and uh, again, uh, if, if I mentioned uh, in the history of codification, uh, Edward Myers, uh, of course, uh, Eugen Huber, the, the Swiss uh, codificator, was an, uh, uh, an, an outstanding lawyer. And uh, again, as Myers was also, uh, Eugen Huber was very, uh, was excellent in, in writing. That's why he was first uh, the, the, the director of a, fav of a famous newspaper. Yeah. And that's the reason why, for me, language is always, has always an, 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 a big importance. I, I don't know how you do it in Hungary, uh, if you, but for me, I think, uh, and that's the po point, codification, you can't do it from, from today to tomorrow as a simple act. Codify would mean and here's one who knows it very well, Hugh Beale, who, uh, who again is an excellent example of how important wording is and the, and the beautiful, let's say, finding a beautiful text as Hugh Beale in the, uh, in for many years in the group for von Bar had done. That's to say, because we, we, we others in the English language, of course, do not have his, uh, <laughs> are <laughs> not so perfect, you know. <laughs> but he was all, yeah, uh, I, I remember you very often, your points when it, it came up uh, to, to writing the text, a real text. And so, and, and that's the reason why a codification will always exist. That's to say lawyers, judges, professors, and so we'll always try to amend codes. We'll always think about it. And they can't do it in one day. But thank you very much for your uh, on, on the uh, uh, Dutch Civil Code, which is an important example again how important variety is and codification. I would like first to thank to the all three panelists. It was really really interesting. Unfortunately, I have now to change my three time my uh, presentation. Good afternoon. Uh, but I would like to ask one, perhaps to the uh, last speaker, my, uh, to address my uh, question to the uh, last speaker, to Kolegi Osipovic, Be because it's something which really interests me. It's, it's a, perhaps a, a question of legal the theory, of legal philosophy, actually, of course, of general part of the civil codification. You have mentioned very uh, numerous uh, exception of the private autonomy. What is actually in the, I think, one research, what do you think about it, one research about this, this basic principle to, uh, in order, to, in order to, uh, to conclude what is really remain of this principle. This principle is so limited in all its aspects, so that I, I ask myself, is it principle anymore? What do you think about it? So, uh, thank you very much for your question. You have right. Uh, I think that uh, today, perhaps we, not only on national level, but on EU level, perhaps there is a need for a new um, definition of practice. What does really mean? Because a lot, uh, it's interesting in fact, because a lot of these rules in uh, EU law that limit uh, private autonomy as we understand this private autonomy on national level, the aim of all these rules is to enforce private autonomy for one contract party for consumers. So, uh, and uh, to, to, in fact, to put consumers in, in position to, uh, to make uh, informed.
on decisions uh, about uh, conclusion of contracts. And I think that uh, this traditional notion of private autonomy, uh, we had when we started to reform uh, our law in the 90s, is completely changed. And that um, a lot of our colleagues, when, when we talk about changes in national law because of EU law are very, very critical. They said, no, it's, it's not okay because it's against freedom of contract, private autonomy. But I think that we have to be aware that this um, old concept of private, private autonomy is totally changed and that we need perhaps uh, to make one uh, comparative research how to define it now in new circumstances. Specifically now, I, I had no time to talk about that in digital, uh, uh, on digital market. On digital market, I think that this traditional private autonomy is even more limited uh, than for when we are talking about consumer companies on EU level. So thank you for your, for your speech. And maybe uh, about this uh, private autonomy, um, the tendency or the trends, the new trends is to create uh, less space for private autonomy because we are unable to be responsible and to sanction uh, bad behaviors. The justice is not efficient. The state cannot provide good service in justice. And we are not able anymore. Uh, I ex it's a, bit, a little bit exaggerated, from <clears throat> but maybe we, we have a real problem with effectiveness of the, of the rule of law. Uh, and better way to solve this problem today is uh, limited, to limit, uh, to create limitations for the private autonomy. And we should maybe uh, have uh, pay attention about how these limits that come from authorities that not, are not elected. Uh, it's not a democratic uh, wish to, to every time have dispositions, a lot of many laws. In France today we have 44 million words from national law, only national law uh, in force. It maybe should be a question uh, why technocrats, only technocrats are dictating so many interdictions, prohibitions. It should be a question, in my point of view, in a democratic space of freedom. You know, I think that uh, something that is uh, also visible when we are to uh, talking specifically about consumer contracts, uh, it's um, sanctions. In fact, we have a lot of public sanctions. Uh, uh, in our Consumer Protection Act, and this is something that is also, in fact, um, um, in line with EU law, because uh, nation, uh, EU state, uh, member states are obliged to regulate effective remedies, and these remedies are more or less public sanctions, uh, uh, monetary uh, penalties, and but. Um, I am not sure that this approach uh, is, in fact, really effective in practice. We have a lot of rules on penalties uh, for traders if they do not behave in line with all these mandatory rules, but it's impossible to, to apply all these uh, penalties in all cases. You know, I think that it's nice to be in, it's, it's nice to be, see in, 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 um, in the, the law, uh, the national state fulfilled the obligations in line with EU law, but it's quite impossible uh, to apply all these uh, rules against each trader who did something wrong in some contract relation. You know, I think that uh, um, perhaps uh, this is, a, uh, on the end, I think that um, a lot of us have, in the moment, very idealistic approach to private autonomy. And we have to be aware that this private autonomy uh, from 19th century, from 
uh, beginning of the uh, 20th century is dead. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not the same relations, uh, hum, uh, social relations, um, reasons for, for regulation of a lot of private uh, relations are so different now that uh, I think that we, uh, there is a really need to find a, a kind of middle approach and to, to define the, the private autonomy on a different way. I must say, for example, when we uh, reformed our property law, uh, one of the biggest problems was how to regulate management of condominium. And uh, uh, we on the faculty, we were in this group, and we said there is no need to regulate management of condominium because uh, co-owners will decide uh, by themselves how they will manage their building because they have interest to manage their building on the, be the best way. And after a few years, we realized that we were totally wrong, that if there is no mandatory rules for, for co-owners how to manage uh, the buildings and how, what to do to, to improve the buildings, that it will be totally ineffective. And uh, the, on the end, the, the consequence of this very liberal approach we had 20 years ago is that we had earthquake three years ago in Zagreb and that a lot of buildings because of a very bad shape were destroyed because there were no specific rules, um, mandatory rules, public rules to, to, to improve the management of the buildings. Thank you very much, and uh, we heard uh, very interesting presentations. And um, uh, my question would be to actually to all of the uh, presenters being here, and uh, starting with uh, the presentation regarding Italy, that uh, what is actually happened related uh, to the non-pecuniary damages was a modification of the code by the courts. And uh, this is uh, also a question to uh, Professor uh, Attila Meinhardt that uh, uh, you, you saw actually the civil code much more as, as, a, as a flexible tool to guide the judge uh, instead of uh, you compare for the administrative uh, re regulation, which is a totally different one. But uh, this, uh, how far? can go with this interpretation. Also, uh, the judge, when establishing the content of, of a norm, uh, there is a limit uh, where this, uh, this uh, interpretation uh, must stop or, or, or not. And uh, so that just would be my question because uh, time is, is limited. Yeah, thank you very much. My question will be uh, on his one. And uh, uh, again, uh, thank you very much to, to all three uh, speakers. Uh, but um, my, let's say, my uh, uh, ideas are also on Professor Meinhardt. That's to say, you mentioned Walter Wilburg, and this was an excellent idea. Um, he, he, he was one of the most interesting lawyers, not only Austrian lawyers, of the 20th century, and uh, having studied first in, in, in Austria and then in Berlin, as a, uh, uh, there he became uh, uh, what we could say a comparative lawyer. That's to say his ideas are deeply uh, rooted in comparative law. And his flexible uh, system, das bewegliche System, you mentioned it, is exactly the point, and here the question, that it uh, uh, is in a certain way uh, gives the judges the opportunity to, uh, uh, to interpret in a more or less stricter way. And this depends now on what rules do you have for interpretation. And so I said, uh, uh, one, uh, the Austrian uh, Civil Code is not so well known around the world, but it has some uh, very interesting aspects, 
as very concrete rules as far as interpretation is concerned. So these rules, together with the flexible system of Walter Wilburg, are, at least in my mind, a guarantee for the existence of codes, both the rules of interpretation and the flexible system. Um, and so I, I would just to add and uh, uh, not to ask you, but to uh, yes, to ask you to reflect on it in the next years. <laughs> thank you very much. So thank you for your question. Um, actually, in Italy, uh, civil liability has become, has become a, a judge-made law, a Richter Recht, especially in the field of non-pecuniary damage, non-compensation for non-pecuniary damage, because uh, of this uh, general clause. I, I think I can uh, define this uh, uh, constitutional principle uh, as a general clause, which is contained in Article 2, and which is specified from point of view of protection of health in Article 32. So this general clause has been interpreted by the jurisprudence in subsequent evolution, in subsequent historical context. And of course, this has led to, to significant modification of the interpretation made by the judge about uh, the uh, limits of uh, compensation for non-pecuniary damages. From this point of view, we can also uh, talk about uh, a, a judge-made law which has been modified by a subsequent judge-made law. It is quite interesting from the point of view of uh, codification and of evolution of codification. That's why I, uh, I thought to, to uh, dedicate my, my speech, my presentation to this aspect, uh, especially uh, from uh, uh, in the evolution from uh, um, Supreme Court judgments of 2008 and the Supreme Court judgments of 2018, there has been quite a significant evolution because uh, 2008, uh, our Supreme Court uh, didn't accept the idea of uh, loss, uh, loss of amenities of life, so what we call ex existential damage, dan existenziale. In uh, 2018, our Supreme Court uh, affirmed that actually from the point of view of uh, uh, loss of dynamic uh, profiles of personality, uh, there could be a place also for uh, existential damage. Actually, in 2018, Supreme Court, Italian Supreme Court, uh, utilized a, a slight different word that is uh, um, damage to, the, to relation life, danno alla vita di relazione. It's a bit difficult perhaps to translate it. Uh, from this point of view, again, I think that uh, uh, there has been actually a, a, a judge-made law in, in progress, so to say, which has been continued, uh, which has known, which has um, faced the continuous evolution, also from the point of view of the role played by punitive damages. I, I just devoted a, a couple of, of phrases to the problem of punitive damages. There has been, uh, I, I said it again, I said it already, uh, a very important uh, judgment in 2017, uh, which uh, uh, opened the, the Italian system to uh, punitive damages in certain limits. Uh, for example, the punitive damages must uh, be uh, foreseen by, uh, disciplinated by a previous uh, law and so on. But there is uh, uh, an open space now also for the uh, sanctioning function of civil liability. I hope I have answered to your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I will be very brief. I think we could start now a very long-lasting discussion. And I, I just want to give some kind of impression to you, to both of you, uh, to your question. The first is, uh, just to this ref reference to Walter Boyeburg, he used the tort law to describe this system. And I think it's an important factor because if uh, we turn to tort law, the fundamental concepts of it, like uh, fault, causal link, uh, don't know, compensable loss, unlawfulness, they are 
such a wide concept that they can't be interpreted themselves. So even if there are some kind of rules, doctrines generally accepted or rules provided in the civil code for interpretation, uh, it doesn't work because they are to be established by the court. Uh, I think that also holds for unjust enrichment, which was also the other uh, area of what Weilburg used. I think uh, I tried to give you an example for contract law, but I see the fundamental concepts like those ones about the binding force of contract. And I don't know, changes of circumstances. OK, there is a rule uh, that there is a change of circumstances or hardship that can uh, make the contract uh, unenforceable. But uh, there are no even guidelines. Perhaps there are some guidelines provided for that, but they are just guidelines to do that. That doesn't mean that the court can't uh, give some uh, more uh, examples for this. And also the concepts like, uh, like uh, the mistake or the duress uh, misrepresentation uh, uh, or unconscionability are such a wide one in all of our jurisdictions, I mean, uh, anyhow we structure them that one cannot use a kind of uh, method of interpretation for that because they simply give uh, the authorization to the court to apply a kind of policy what they want to reach. I don't mean that all of the rules or all of the provisions of the civil code have the very same quality because in a civil code there can be very clear cut rules. I mean, if uh, there is a time limit for, I don't know, five years, 10 years, a court is not authorized to say that it should be less or, or more. That, that's not what I mean by that. Uh, but even if, uh, if a provision of the civil code is such a concrete one, there are still the general clauses, which mean that uh, if uh, there is a general clause that uh, rights and obligations should be performed and exercised uh, according to the requirement of good faith and fair dealing as an algorithm is just like giving a rule somewhere in the civil code and saying that you have this right except it is against the good faith and fair dealing. That means that according to my view, there is a general authorization provided to the courts for that. Um, if, it, if it is a satisfactory reaction, I don't, I mean, it's, a, it's an answer than anything. Oh, thank you very much. I just would love to add some element for this uh, passionate deba debate about the, the, the limits or the liberty that has the judge to apply law. I think one of the elements uh, to understand the, the real problem that day-to-day -day life uh, is uh, uh, observable, can be seen in the, in the courts is the cultural element. For example, in France, we have this system. And it was um, what Portalis would love to have. Portalis said in his discourse, l'office de la loi est de fixer par des grandes vues les maximes générales du droit, établir des principes féconds en conséquence, et non descendre dans le détail des questions qui peuvent naître sur chaque matière. C'est au magistrat et au jurisconsulte pénétrer de l'esprit général de loi à en diriger l'application. And we, I come from this citation this, uh, by quoting this, this part of the discourse uh, to the creative role of the judges. It's a real question today in France. We know that everywhere. But I think, the, as I told, the element is to one of the one of the most important elements for this issue is cultural one, which is, it depends on the reality, the sociology of this, the society concerned. For example, in France it works because the French charges are not revolutionary. They are self restrict A sense of measure, it's very French. They normally don't go too far in interpretation, and they know the whole important role of the parliament and of the politics. It's not the same in Brazil. In Brazil, we have revolutionary judges, and they are many, with different and many courts, many levels. 
with many power, so many power, much power, because all these judges in Brazil have power to declare the inconstitutionality of a law, of a disposition, law disposition, or of terms of a contract, and they do it freely. And it depends a lot, as I told before, of the specific culture concerned by the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for allowing me a question. I have, uh, and I hope I pronounce uh, your name correctly, Mr. M Professor Menyard. Um, a question for you. Um, you made some provocative statements. Uh, all law is judge-made law, and I understood, and perhaps the, the value of a civil code is a bit overrated. Um, I'm not going to uh, go into that myself, but I would like, if I may, to cite some words of the drafter of the current Dutch civil code, Professor Meyers, uh, who actually in one of his speeches uh, dealt with uh, exactly uh, the question, uh, uh, what makes a code valuable? Is a code valuable? And what he said, and uh, I will translate on the spot, so I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, what he said, uh, the importance of a civil code is very hard to establish by experience. If you consult uh, the legal uh, decisions, uh, you will only find here and there some flaws of the legislation. But who would uh, actually uh, would consult only judicial decisions in order to establish the value of a civil code uh, would do exactly the same as someone who would uh, investigate the uh, strength of a nation, of the uh, inhabitants of a nation, uh, by means of merely uh, visiting hospitals. Uh, the value of a civil code, he says, uh, only appears if you also look at the uh, cases um, in which it normally functions, in which it brings questions to clarity without that there is reasonable doubt or judicial interference necessary. So he actually cuts the judicial interference off in order to, uh, in order to establish the value of a civil code. And then he continues, and that's the final sentence, uh, that in that respect, a properly formulated system of general rules offers more advantages than uh, a less uh, systemized and incomplete and difficult uh, complex of precedents, <laughs> sorry, um, uh, is clear. I hope you understood my, my uh, translation on the spot, but what do you think about this statement of Professor Meyer? I, I, I give you to both of you just a very simple reaction that thank you very much indeed for them, because simply I don't want to go on with such a long-lasting debate. I don't disagree with that. I wouldn't say it at all. I simply want to say that uh, the quality of, of a civil code, I mean the quality of the rule or the nature of the rule provided in the civil code is not, not just the same as a kind of uh, re regulation of that. And I think that within a civil code that also was for the Hungarian one, I also could give examples for this as well. I tried to give you examples for, for different, uh, uh, different attempts of, of the legislator as, as, as well. I, and I simply want to say that uh, I think that the civil code or the written norm in civil law has to be seen together with the court practice and the role of interpretation. Um, and that's, that's what I wanted to mean. I don't really see a contradiction in that. Perhaps I'm, I, I misunderstood something in what you have said. But I, um, I, I well, well, the, 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 the point Myers may is, makes that, uh, is that uh, you can even take away away the judicial decisions in order to establish the value of a code. Yes, I, that's, you agree? I, I, I agree with that, that it can be done. I also tried to give you an example of that, like uh, just, uh, I didn't mean a Hungarian example, but in, in France was, the, was this loi perouche, because in Hungary 
it very, very same thing happened in tort law, but it was not the legislator, but the Supreme Court overruling itself and providing that we awarded this kind of uh, damages in wrongful life cases, but we, didn't, we wouldn't do it in the future because we see that we are alone in Europe. The very same can be done, the very same thing can be done by the legislator or by the court. It doesn't really matter which one want to do that. I think it's also an example, it also happened in Hungary with revising the rules concerning the non pecuniary damages, but I can't go into the details of that. I will do it in the written contribution, but I can't do it in the moment where it was the very same what the Hungarian legislator did. That he said that, uh, that there was a certain uh, prerequisite uh, of awarding non pecuniary damages by the court practice, and the legislator wanted to say that can't be a prerequisite anymore because the courts are wrong with do that because they limit the availability of this remedy. I think it's also an example for that. That's what I also, also perhaps my attitude was when not, didn't go into this line, but uh, I also tried to mention you examples for similar like this, what you mentioned. So I think the basic evaluation is to be provided by the legislator. Uh, so now, uh, today, we heard that there are, when we are talking about civil law reform, two basic approach. Civil code as comprehensive legislation and different separate acts. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, we didn't mention it today, although we are all more or less all law professors here, how these uh, different approaches influence um, legal studying, legal teaching, and research. Um, um, experience from Croatia is that, for example, family law is totally separated from uh, contract law, property law, inheritance law. We even have a specific chair only for family law. We have specialists only in family law. And I think that it is also something that we should discuss when we are talking about different approaches to <coughs> uh, ref civil law legislation. And my, uh, I don't know how it is in your countries. Or for example, we have also a, 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 a separated chair for private international law. They are specialists in this field, but I'm not sure that they understand everything about contracts, although they know everything about uh, applicable law in some cross-border cases. Uh, and um, my second concern is that uh, um, in former socialist countries, uh, it's visible that we have a lot of legal transplants. Uh, and that um, I don't know what is your experience, but are these legal transplants sometimes results of specific influence of some foreign associations who took part in, in reform, in a way, or it is all, uh, something what was decision made by state independently. Okay, yeah, that's a good. That's a good point. What does it mean for legal studies and legal research? Definitely, uh, different acts mean also. Um, some kind of specialization of teachers and researchers. And uh, we have already talked a couple of times about the problem of family law. It's the same in Ljubljana, it's Zagreb. Um, our, we, don't have, we don't have separate departments, but uh, uh, teachers for family law, for example, are special, specialized only for this, only for this field. And um, this year is the last year uh, of, uh, at my faculty of bachelor and master studies. Uh, we succeeded to impose uh, the integrated five-year legal studies in Zagreb. And one of the consequences of this reform uh, is also that we will separate in future the subject civil law. Today, the subject civil law contains obligations, property, and uh, inheritance. 
but uh, in the, after this new reform, this will be three separated subjects. And I'm afraid that in this case, also the content will be, a little, will be more and more uh, moving in a moving in a moving in a, in a different way. Yes, this in such case not to have not to have the comprehensive civil code. I'm afraid that uh, such specialization could endanger uh, the legal doctrine. Uh, speaking about legal transplants uh, in field of civil law, I think in Slovenia uh, we don't have many of them. Um, on the other hand, in field of, for example, of company law, the Slovenian uh, Companies Act is more or less in field of uh, uh, um, joint stock company, the translation of German Aktiengesetz. And um, yes, there are many problems because uh, it's not uh, the, the, the legal, it's quite difficult to, to, to take Oh, to take one institute and put the same institute in different legal framework. It's not so easy just to lift something and put input in the, in, the other, in the other legal systems. There are so many connections and links, and usually these connections and links to the institute are not harmonized. So sometimes we have a very strange rule which could not be like a puzzle in the, like a puzzle in the picture. That's, that is the danger of, of legal transplant. But as I said, in this pure civil law, we don't, have, uh, we don't have many of them. But I'm afraid, I'm really afraid of another thing. Uh, the language of European law. Because the language of European directives uh, are, uh, is very different as language of classical civil codification. And in Slovenia, in my country, uh, the bureaucrats uh, must fulfill their homework to implement the, to harmonize the national legal system with European directive. And the most easiest way to do this is just to take the rule from European directive and to put this rule in the same wording in law. And I cannot imagine the mixture of uh, legal language from European, from European consumer protection directives with the language of obligation code. May I start with the second questions? question? Uh, yes, um, I think uh, in the smaller countries or weaker countries with more political or structural problem as Bosnia is uh, legal transplant or transfer of law uh, played one more, more important but uh, play, uh, imp important role and uh, uh, I think we have really support and uh, it could be very, it could be clear benefit for one country, the expertise uh, from, uh, from abroad. But it's, uh, it comes for me uh, up to attitudes to one country's to this. Our authorities was absolutely passive. It was very important, uh, uh, one organization from country a uh, cam, uh, uh, comes to ministry and said, okay, we will buy a new car, we will buy new furniture for the ministry, and then we can do something in your, in your legal, uh, legal order, really. Uh, 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 that I have mentioned that this different influence uh, had a positive result in the field of the, of the security, uh, security transaction, uh, it's a due only uh, to one uh, uh, moment. One organization and one German organization was behind all this 
reform, and these reforms were coordinated. And also legal scholars from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, uh, were included in, in this uh, discussion and, and, dra and drafting. Uh, normally, uh, by assessment of the, of the tr transformation in the former socialist cut country, it, it, it was written a lot of, and uh, I think we mentioned also Professor Harmati, uh, also he foc has a research in this, in this um, uh, field. And it was stated that uh, when uh, one international organization, governmental or non-governmental, uh, draft, uh, drafted some reform, there was not public debate. Uh, it was the anonymous uh, domestic expert were engaged uh, without, uh, without uh, scholars uh, and uh, it, uh, it was also uh, uh, relevant how powerful one organization is. For example, this uh, um, uh, law uh, on registered pledge, which is um, from Ameri of American uh, origin, was enacted in the state law, and it's a very clear state law, uh, state Bosnian state level. Bosnia and Herzegovina does not have this competence. Uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina is only in this sense com uh, comparable with European Union. Only this, what is ex expressly stated in the constitution, is competence of Bosnia, and register register pledge is not mentioned. But the American USAID. Uh, was behind. No objection, law has, has been enacted. Then we have very serious reform of the Obligation Act. Uh, uh, really drafted with, uh, from Professor Rusman from Saarbrücken with, uh, uh, with Bosnian and Herzegovinian uh, scholar and expert. And it was a very good piece of leg legislation. We, we have discussed it, uh, the break. Uh, in this moment, it was 2006, the uh, uh, European uh, directives which were in force in this time were very carefully implemented in the corpus of the Obligation Act and uh, it was refused in Parliament since there is no competition of the state level. But Bosnia and Herzegovina has competition which had come to the for freedom of the internal, inter, small internal market of Bosnia and Herzegovina, our authorities have never used this uh, this possibility. So that uh, I think uh, we uh, lucky. We were lucky uh, with this approach of the authorities. We get not so bad, uh, not so bad re result. And then uh, to the. Um, uh, codification and the systematic, uh, I'm really convinced that uh, if, if you teach this as whole, if you study this as whole, it makes sense. For example, Austrian example, where the students uh, have to, uh, to make exam from general part of law until international uh, private law, it's, of course it's a challenging, but it, it give a good result, or uh, not uh, to, to speak about the German German system, which is very very strict, but also with top result. I uh, I would like to say uh, we have one more problem. Not only that the, the professor, I cannot imagine that someone can teach whole life only family law, or. Or only inheritance law so far, uh, you lose connection uh, to the entirety first. And for the students, and I think we will, uh, it, uh, the Bologna reform was implemented in the Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in such a way that we uh, make for each this branch one exam. And students pass uh, exam in the winter semester in introduction to civil law, and when we teach property law and inheritance, they, for they forgot. 
forget, forget it. So that uh, it's uh, yes, it's a, it, it's a problem. It's it, it has he really bad impact on research, on teaching, and as final result on the knowledge uh, of the students and future and future professionals. Well, thank you. Um, I would like to come back to the legal transplants because I think they are very interesting from the methodological point of view. And my question would go to Professor Juhart. Uh, you mentioned that in Slovenia, the German law on joint stock companies was more or less copied. And we know that uh, the German law on joint stock companies has a large chapter on groups of companies, Konzernrecht. Um, and we know that German courts um, extended the application of the law uh, groups of companies in a very broad way. They applied in on, on companies with limited liability and have hugely further developed that law. My question is, would you apply uh, that law in Slovenia as it laid down in the Joint Stock Company Act or would you also apply those extensions developed by German courts? Yeah, it's quite easy. We, uh, the Companies Act applied the, 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 also the rules uh, of Verbundene Unternehmen uh, from German law, but not the, but not the case law from, uh, from courts. So uh, sometimes uh, our practitioners have problems how to interpret, interpret the, the, the rules, and in these cases uh, they have to know the German language to look in the uh, German doctrine and uh, German court uh, uh, and German case law. It's, it, it's very, it's very, it's very easy. But on the other hand, in a small country, um, sometimes it's quite difficult because the number of cases is very limited. And uh, in some fields of law, uh, in 30 years, uh, we don't have any case. For example, in in uh, this is a, in concern and law, in concern and there is there is there is almost no cases. So that's so, the most easy answer. Yeah, that's that, that's quite easy, and uh, in the, in this way, sometimes uh, uh, the legal it's difficult to assess the success of of the legal transplant because uh, it's just too complicated. Uh, for the uh, for the for the society for our society. 